Officials from a nuclear power plant in Taiwan have invited the media to see the safety features of their facility. Construction isn't finished. Political squabbling has played a part in delaying the project for over 10 years. Taiwan Power Company runs the plant. Media toured the Lungmen facility in New Taipei City. Taiwan has six other reactors. Most are in the populated area near Taipei. Reporters viewed the Japanese-made reactors. They also saw pools for fuel rod storage and the turbine generators. Officials from the Taiwanese utility stressed the plant's resistance to earthquakes and tsunami. Watertight steel gates protect the pumping station that supplies cooling water to the reactor. Company officials also explained a system that sends cooling water to the reactors from a reservoir located on high ground. It can operate in a total power outage. Public protests to stop the project have increased. People complain about construction problems and safety concerns after Fukushima. A local TV station took a survey. 70% of respondents wanted construction suspended. The Taiwanese government plans to hold a referendum on the project. World leaders are trying to figure out how to deal with the provocations coming from Pyongyang. The one big question, how far has North Korea's nuclear program progressed? Mark Fitzpatrick is an expert in nuclear policy and spent 26 years with the U.S. State Department. He's now director of a non-proliferation and disarmament program at an international institute for strategic studies. He joins us from London. Mr. Fitzpatrick, scientists at the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization say they've detected a radioactive substance, xenon, possibly from a nuclear test North Korea carried out in February. How close are they to building warheads small enough to fit on ballistic missiles? One can't say for sure, but North Korea has been working on nuclear-related explosives for over 20 years, and they probably obtained nuclear weapons designs from the Pakistan-based Abdul Qadir Khan black market network. So I assume that they probably could uh, mount a uh, nuclear warhead on one of their ballistic missiles, probably not one of the longer range missiles because uh, that's a more difficult task. The question is whether any such nuclear warhead would be reliable, whether it could survive the heat and buffeting of, uh, of the acceleration and then the re-entry. And I think it's that uh, uncertainty which leads many governments to say, well, they can't say with any, um, any uh, conclusive uh, uh, confidence that North Korea actually has a nuclear weapon. Now, we know they're capable of extracting plutonium from spent fuel rods. Do you think they've used enriched uranium in the third test? We were all waiting to uh, see what kind of results might be obtained from the capture of any uh, xenon gases in the atmosphere by the CTBTO. And when none, when none were discovered uh, uh, in the couple weeks after the test, uh, the hope of uh, knowing uh, whether it was plutonium or highly enriched uranium uh, disappeared. Uh, the CTBTO can't tell um, based on xenon uh, captured this late in the game. But North Korea has been working on the uranium enrichment program for over 10 years, so I think it can be presumed that they are capable of producing highly enriched uranium. It's just not possible to conclude that they actually have such a weapon without any evidence uh, that would uh, uh, be solid basis for saying that. Is a nuclear North Korea inevitable, uh, inevitable in the future? And if so, what options do world leaders have other than accepting the status quo? Uh, the question is, um, is it inevitable that North Korea will retain this nuclear arsenal? They say that they won't give them up until the United States uh, gives up its nuclear weapons. Uh, equating themselves with the world's uh, superpower. Uh, not exactly uh, a reasonable comparison. Uh, so uh, my own analysis is that uh, we can take North Korea at its word in this case and uh, assume that they won't trade away their nuclear weapons for any amount of economic or diplomatic benefits because they see the nuclear weapons as necessary to maintain their regime. In fact, it's the maintenance of these weapons that prevents North Korea from obtaining the aid, trade and investment from the West, from Japan and other countries that would actually help them escape their poverty trap and keep the regime alive. But they see it differently. They think they need the weapons to preserve themselves. They're not going to give them up ever, I believe. You earlier mentioned about North Korea and the Pakistan network. 
Another concern for world leaders are spreading of nuclear technology. How does the development in North Korea help the Iranian nuclear program? And it's a logical conclusion. Uh, each has something that the other needs. Iran has oil and uh, money. North Korea has uh, some proven technology in processing plutonium and in um, advances in enrichment of uranium as well. But the evidence is still very circumstantial, so I hesitate to, to draw any conclusions. Uh, one, what one uh, can say is that Iran is certainly looking carefully at how uh, North Korea is uh, being dealt with by the world. And to the extent that North Korea is seen to be getting away with uh, testing nuclear weapons, pulling out of the NPT and threatening its neighbors, Iran might draw some conclusions uh, that uh, in the future, if it decides to take a similar path, it could similarly get away with it. It's one additional reason to, uh, uh, to, for the world to pull together to put pressure on North Korea uh, to make sure that it uh, that there are costs to this program to ensure that North Korea cannot obtain more of the material and components via China and elsewhere uh, for its nuclear and ballistic missile programs and above all to ensure that it is not able to transfer any of this technology and material to Iran. Mark Fitzpatrick of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. U.S. researchers say North Korean scientists and engineers are nearing completion of an experimental light water nuclear reactor. The country claims the reactor is intended for power generation, but it could add to worries over its nuclear program. Researchers at Johns Hopkins University analyzed satellite imagery of the reactor in Nyombyon. They say a dome was placed over the reactor containment building and cooling water pipes appear to have been installed by last November. The external construction of the building was complete in February of this year. A large construction crane had been disassembled and removed by late March. The researchers say the reactor could go into operation within a few months if nuclear fuel is available. But they say North Korea's lack of experience is operating light, in operating rather, light water reactors raises serious safety concerns. The analysts say the reactor seems to be designed to produce electricity for the civilian economy, but they add that it will have a residual capability to produce plutonium that can be used for nuclear weapons. The Japanese reconstruction minister has visited Chernobyl in Ukraine to learn how people there are recovering from the disaster. It was the site of the world's worst nuclear accident in 1986. Takumi Nemoto visited the nuclear power plant in Chernobyl on Saturday. Ukrainian officials and engineers explained to him how the accident occurred and what the government has done in its wake. They also briefed him on how they store spent fuel and decontaminate local communities. It's important to keep evacuees informed and provide them with mental health care. I was interested in facilities in Ukraine that serve those purposes. The Japanese government recently rezoned evacuation areas in Fukushima based on radiation levels. This has enabled some residents to visit their homes and prepare to live there again. The authorities are seeking effective decontamination measures and long-term health care plans for residents. Experts on disaster prevention are outlining what could happen if the so-called Nankai Trough quake strikes Japan. They say it is possible high-rise buildings in Tokyo could sway back and forth for more than 20 minutes. The Nankai Trough is a subduction zone where one plate descends below the edge of another. It stretches for 900 kilometers off the coast of central to western Japan. The government asked disaster prevention experts to look at how the Nankai trough quake w uh, could affect high-rise buildings. The experts found that in the worst-case scenario, the surface of the ground would shake for more than 10 minutes in Tokyo, Osaka, and Nagoya. The swaying or oscillation of buildings would be most pronounced at the top of high-rises. Professor Yoshiaki Hisada of Kogakuin University in Tokyo used the analysis to run his own oscillation tests. He chose a 29-story building on his campus. He used computer modeling to reproduce its structure. He discovered that the highest part of the building would shake nearly three meters from side to side about three minutes after a quake. 
He found that the building's oscillation could last more than 20 minutes and could be nearly five times larger than the sway caused by the March 2011 earthquake. Worse, the force could warp the joints of poles and crossbeams more than expected, possibly causing walls and ceilings to collapse. We now know the possible effects of the Nankai Trough quake. We need to strengthen the structure of buildings, especially tall ones, even though it will cost a lot. Professor Hisada says the quake wouldn't cause buildings to collapse, but he says shelves should be fixed to prevent injuries from long-period oscillation. Well, speaking about ammunition and fighting the government, the Environmental Protection Agency is now talking about raising the radiation limits, the maximum allowable radiation limits after a nuclear accident. To me, and probably many others, this really seems like just one more way of making the Fukushima Daiichi problem go away. That's right. If you can't decrease the water level, you elevate the bridge. <laughs> so um, the truth is that if there is a nuclear accident, it doesn't matter what your standards to exposure to radiation for human beings. After a nuclear accident like Fukushima, the large contiguous areas become extremely radioactive and will be so for hundreds of years. So it's really just putting the icing on the cake, so to speak. The cake's already there, and they're admitting that they can do nothing about it. It gave everyone a shock, but the truth is that once an area's been contaminated, that's it. And I suppose they're just coming to terms with reality. But it's very, very scary, and it makes people understand what a nuclear accident would really mean. Now, a nuclear plant releases a bunch of different types of radiation, in my report, I, I spent a lot of time talking about the noble gases that were released. Enormous concentrations for five or six days of noble gases came out of Fukushima Daiichi. Now, they are inside the fuel, and as soon as the fuel cracks, we don't need a meltdown, as soon as the fuel cracks, the gases escape into the containment. But I think what Daiichi showed us is that uh, the containments failed as well. So the last barrier of defense failed, releasing huge amounts of noble gases. Can you talk a little bit about some of the medical consequences? Well, yeah. now, I think you said only three times more noble gases were released at Fukushima than at Chernobyl. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Noble gases or noble elements are those that do not combine chemically with anything in the body. They're sort of kind of neutral because, you know, carbon-14 actually combines in the DNA molecule, so does tritium and strontium as a calcium analog gets into bone, etc. But noble gases don't go specifically to anywhere in the body because of their chemical uh, makeup. However, noble gases are very high energy gamma emitters like x-rays and so if you're immersed in a cloud of noble gases you're going to get a big dose of radiation, external radiation like an x-ray. However, if you inhale the noble gases and they are xenon, krypton and argon, xenon being the worst, you inhale the gases and in fact they readily pass through the alveoli um, the little air sacs in the lung into the blood where they circulate and they are fat soluble so they they deposit in the fatty tissues of the body which are the abdominal fat pad and the upper thighs where there's a lot of fat and they there irradiate very important cells with gamma radiation the ovaries and testicles and so people who who are immersed in a cloud of radioactive gases like at Fukushima and Three Mile Island and Chernobyl get a hell of a dose of radiation, not just to the ovaries and testicles, which are very important, but to other organs of the body. I used to use xenon-133 in my patients to estimate their lung function. Patients with cystic fibrosis have their lungs clogged up with pus and mucus, very thick mucus. And so areas of the lung become totally non-functional. So we would do ventilation fusion scans to see what areas of the lung are in, are in truth being ventilated and what areas are being perfused by the blood. And we are now using um, xenon-133 
to uh, look at fatty tumors in the body to isolate them because, as I said, it, uh, they're very fat soluble, these noble gases. Well, let me refer our listeners to the, the presentation I gave at the conference where I spent a large amount of time talking about the, the noble gas releases. So if you want to learn more about the quantities that were released, and like I said, there are three times what was released after Chernobyl, go over to uh, the Fairwinds website, and there's a separate uh, video on the presentation that, that I made through the Caldecott Foundation in uh, New York City back in March. Ani, I've got a question. Can you extrapolate from the fact that there are three times more noble gases released at Fukushima than Chernobyl to other isotopes too? Could you therefore say that most of the other isotopes would be three times that released at Chernobyl or not? Yeah, I talk about that in the presentation. Some of the isotopes do plate out. I think the cesium concentration is going to be comparable to what was released at Chernobyl. Uh, there was some played out in chemical reactions, but I think the IAEA and the Japanese are grossly downplaying the cesium releases. You know, if you go back to what Steve Wing said in Harrisburg four years ago, you know, there were noticeable increases in lung cancer for the people that lived within 30 miles of Three Mile Island in the first 10 days of the accident. So five years after the accident, people began to get lung cancer. And that's the only thing Steve could measure, but I attribute that to uh, to breathing uh, enormous amounts of noble I think, yes, I think you might be right about that. In fact, I think that lung cancer started to appear two years after the Three Mile Island accident, which is extremely early. You would not expect lung cancers to arise for probably 15 years, but they, they appeared very early, which would indicate, therefore, that the people at Three Mile Island got a hell of a dose of gamma radiation to their lungs from the noble gases as they inhaled them. And so we would expect to see that around Fukushima now. We're just sitting on a powder keg of, of cancers. And where it goes in your body and what it does to your body. Cesium, there are three isotopes, 137, 134, and one, I can't remember the other one, Arnie. But cesium-137 has a half-life of 30 years, which you multiply by 10 to get its total radiological life. It's to 